Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming to this uh, uh, webinar being organized by the Mercies Project. Uh, Mercies uh, stands for Marine Ecosystem Restoration in Changing European Seas, and it's a blue, uh, a, a, a blue project or blue growth project uh, funded by the European Community. Uh, it started in 2016. Uh, and ends uh, in May next year. So we're now just entering our final six months and you can find out a lot about the project uh, by going to our website. Uh, and over the next six months, I think there are at least 20 or so deliverables uh, to come through from all the work that's been going on in the project uh, for the last three and a half years. Um, so we're very pleased that uh, we're able to bring this webinar to you. It's the fourth of five webinars we have planned. And uh, I'm very grateful for being able to co-host this with Grid Arundel, who are doing all the wonderful wizardry behind the scenes for us, uh, and particularly Tanya Bryan and to uh, Rob Barnes there at Grid. Uh, I'm also grateful to my co-convenor, Ava Ramirez, at the Norwegian Institute for Water Research and, and Rev Ocean, uh, in Oslo uh, for helping us organize these uh, webinars and also to my friend here uh, Andrew Gates at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton uh, for hosting me in his office uh, to be able to bring this to you and I hope we will have a good connection uh, throughout this period. Um, in order to fulfill the aims for blue growth, um, what we're aiming to do in Mercies and in these webinars in particular is to bring together industry and policy makers and decision takers and scientists to promote best practices in marine ecosystem restoration and to really try and get people to talk about this, the value of, being able to, uh, of doing this work uh, and the real benefits that come to communities in, in doing so. So in this particular webinar, uh, we are pleased to if I can find my two speakers. There we go. Uh, we are very pleased that uh, Per Olaf Moxness at the University of Gothenburg and Richard Unsworth at the University of Swansea are our two guest speakers and I'm very grateful for them uh, for their time really. Uh, I know they're both incredibly busy people and uh, so this is a, a good opportunity but from what I can see so far of the number of people joining us uh, it should be a very worthwhile exercise we have a very varied community of attendees and everybody really is very interested in seagrass meadow. So it's a good thing to be able to contribute to. Now, each of the talk will last about 20 minutes. Per Olaf will go first and then Richard will follow on directly after. And at the end of Richard's talk, we are going to have a general discussion and uh, it's very important, really. We want your interaction as uh, listeners, uh, but we want to be able to give you the opportunity to enter a discussion. Uh, the trouble is there are so many of you uh, that we can't really allow this as a free for all. Um, so we have organized this uh, and found to be quite successful as a moderated discussion. So on your Zoom uh, in, uh, window at the moment, you should be able to see a little box saying Q and A. And if you click on that box, then a separate window appears into which you can type your questions uh, or for the speakers. Uh, and this can be done anytime during the talks. In fact, I'm really pleased if you could type your questions as soon as possible, because it allows me as a moderator then to bring these together uh, in a timely fashion for when we start our discussion. But if your question at the end comes to you, then uh, of course you can do that at the time. So please do keep uh, the questions coming. Uh, and uh, if you don't want to actually be identified on that Q&A box, you should be able to see a tick box saying uh, anonymous. Uh, so you're also able to submit this question, should you wish to, uh, anonymously. And at the end, I hope we will be able to answer all the questions. Uh, but if not, I will probably ask the speakers if they would like to be able to respond in writing to some of those. And we will put these on our website uh, alongside the archive webinar. Uh, 
Okay, so without any further delay, uh, could I introduce to you Per Olaf Moxnes from the University of Gothenburg, uh, and uh, we are ready for his talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> David, for that nice introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? If there's someone there that could uh, maybe give me a feedback that everything is working as according to plan. Uh, yes, you're, we can hear you fine, uh, Per. Excellent. Then I will start my presentation. Thanks again. And, and thanks also to Mercis for this nice opportunity to present our research here in, in this forum. Much, much appreciated. So this talk today will be focusing what happens, maybe not so much about the restoration, although we will get into that, but also what happens when you lose an eelgrass meadows. You will lose a lot of different type of ecosystem services and that you might lose the whole function of the ecosystem. I will talk initially a little bit about that, but focusing on what happens in the sediment and the stock of carbon, but also nutrients like nitrogen that might be stored there, what happens to this, this stock when you lose an ingress meadow. And I will end to talk a bit more about how you can use restoration to mitigate these type of problems and what challenges there also are with eelgrass restoration. Uh, but first, I would like to acknowledge that these results that I will present today comes from a big interdisciplinary group in Sweden that works with questions related to management and eelgrass restoration. We've been working with these questions for about 10 years now, and it involves not only natural scientists as biologists as myself, but also legal scholars as well as, as uh, environmental economists that will work with different aspects of these management questions. So this talk will be about eelgrass, and I understand most of you are quite familiar with seagrasses, and I would like to maybe put some extra attention today that these seagrasses has the rather unique ability to anchor themselves to soft sediment and thereby uh, create a new environment in an otherwise quite barren sand or mud bottoms. And that changes a lot of also physical parameters in these, these environments that are quite important. In northwestern Sweden, where I work, but in the most of Scandinavia, where the salinity is about 5 PSU, eelgrass is the dominant vegetation of soft sediment bottom. And one usually says that they work as ecosystem engineers by stabilizing the bottom and buffer the, the wave energy and the currents and filtrating the water, creating much clearer water. So they improve the water quality. And, and that is quite important, and we will come back to that. But they also, of course, create habitat for a large number of plants and animals, and they increase the biodiversity and the production of fish and shellfish. And these are quite well known and studied ecosystem services that we will hear more about, I think, with Richard here in a little bit. But in this talk, I will focus more on this stabilizing effect and, and, the, and the sequestration of organic material into the seagrass meadows. Uh, this uh, importance of eelgrass and other seagrass species are quite important because they also have quite vulnerable habitats. They are sensitive to water quality changes in particularly. And in Sweden, we've been having large losses on the Northwest coast of, of the country. It's estimated that approximately 60% of the eelgrass has been lost since the 1980s. And this is approximately uh, equivalent of a 12,500 hectares, which is quite an astonishing amount of eelgrass. It's, it's uh, equivalent to the size of this island here. And these large losses have happened more or less without any attention because most people didn't know how much eelgrass we had and there was no monitoring. So in contrast, when these type of losses happen on land, you can have large changes in the marine environment without anyone really noticing. But what I'm trying to make a point of today that maybe we should notice because they do perform a lot of important ecosystem services. And uh, this particular loss has been most severe in the southern part of this area, just north of Gothenburg, called the Mastran area. Here in the 1980s, we had one of the largest eelgrass beds in the country. It was, uh, the whole area was just full of eelgrass on, on, the, on the mainland side. And in the year 2000, 2004, when the new surveys were done, almost 70% had vanished. And the main reason for this loss is thought to be related to eutrophication, too much nutrients in the water that creates this type of fast growing filamentous algae that covers the bed and more or less suffocate them from both light and oxygen. And this recent research has also shown that maybe this is related also to 
to overfishing and trophic cascade that promotes the growth of these algae. There's been a lot of effort to reduce the nutrient supply to the Swedish coast, and it's been quite successful. And this is some data showing the improving trends of water quality. We see the sec depth here has increased since the 1990s. And today, when you use water column parameters, indicators of the water quality, it's usually good or high status of the water. So you would think this is an indication that eelgrass might come back naturally because of the improved water quality, but there has been really no natural recovery of eelgrass. Instead, the losses in this hardly affected area, Mastran area, has just continued. In the 2000 years, we had almost, oh, sorry, about 300 hectares of eelgrass loft in this area, but when the more recent survey was conducted, it's only less than 100 hectares left, and it's very little Overall, in some areas, more than 95% of the eelgrass has been lost. And there's only a few uh, patchy uh, meadows left in, in certain areas. So this is a bit surprising because we have an improved water quality, but still the losses continues. So what's going on? And we've been focusing on these problems in relation to trying to restore the eelgrass in this area. And we can look at this particular spot here on the coast where there used to be a large eelgrass bed in the year 2000. Today, the water looks like this. And what we think has happened here is some local regime shift, which is a term used when you have one state dominating, you have a sudden shift to another state and, and no return of the, of the previous state. What's going on, we think, is when you lose an eelgrass bed, you lose the stabilizing effect of the bed on the bottom. So you have an increase with suspension of sediment and make the water very turbid. And that in turn makes the water so of poor water quality that eelgrass can no longer grow here. And in this particular area, we have a lot of glacial mud in the sediment that sort of makes this problem even worse. We have done several attempts to restore eelgrass here in this area. And, uh, and, and uh, with no success. Basically, the eelgrass does, can no longer grow in this environment. And to make matters worse, we have also a prolification of macroalgae, big perennial algae like fucus, like, like uh, seaweed that grows on the bottom. And this creates mats that smothers any attempt for eelgrass to come back here naturally. In this picture, you see this red area, and it's an historic eelgrass bed. It was all, all, all over 200 hectares large. And the, and the black area, as you see there today, is actually drift algae on the bottom. And here we also made several attempts to restore eelgrass, but it dies within months because of bad water quality and it's being covered of this math of drifting algae. So we have a very difficult situation here now where, where eelgrass have trouble to come back naturally and even restoration is very difficult. So yeah, so, so it's, 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 an, it's a bad, bad situation here right now. So if I try to summarize the processes, which is a bit complicated, so when you have a healthy eelgrass bed, because of the idea that it works like an ecosystem engineer, it can improve the water quality by stabilizing the bottom and slow down the currents and filtrating the water. And by improving the water quality and the light condition, it sort of improves its own growth condition. So it gets better and better and you have a positive spiral. But then if you have some sort of disturbance, like eutrophication, or maybe you build a marina in the area, you have dredging that temporarily make the amount of eelgrass less, you might pass a threshold, a tipping point, so that the water quality is so bad, so the eelgrass go, grows a little bit worse than it did before. And when you have less eelgrass, you have even worse light condition, and you have a negative spiral. And this continue until the eelgrass is lost. And also in, in, at the same time, because the eelgrass becomes more spare, drifting algae can enter the meadow and speed up this decreasing process. And in the end, you have lost the eelgrass and you have very turbid water that doesn't allow eelgrass growth and the algae prevent it from returning. And you have locked it in this new state and you have the regime shift. And we think this is what's happening on the local scale. And because of this turbid water spreading to neighboring areas, we think this is like a plague that is now slowly moving up along with the currents along the coast and making the eelgrass disappear more and more. All right, so now I've been discussing the problem when you lose eelgrass, but one question that comes to mind, you lose quality and you lose habitat, but what happens to the nitrogen and carbon that might be stored in the sediment? 
And this, this we set out to study in this area. First of all, I want to like to point out that there are unusually high amount of carbon in Scandinavian seagrass meadows. This is a survey done on a global scale because eelgrass is found around the globe from the Americas to Japan, etc. And the blue bars here are all from Danish on the Swedish West Coast water. And you can see they are unusually high or rich in carbon. So they're quite important carbon stock, these old eelgrass meadows. And we started to investigate this further by doing very deep eelgrass cores in these meadows. And you can see here on the picture here on, on the bottom, the, the white circles there is an eelgrass meadow and the black ones are in, yes, next to the eelgrass meadow. You can see they have very high carbon contents, around 10% going down over a meter in depth. And this, this depth is over two meters, maybe three meters deep, this accumulation of sediment, probably 100 or millennia years old. So you have very high amount of carbon in the sediment. And if you compare the value in the sediment, you can see that more than 99% of the carbon in the meadow is in the sediment, it's not in the living eelgrass tissue. So that's important to remember. So an old meadow is valuable because it's storing a lot of carbon in the sediment. We also analyzed the nutrients in this sediment. You can see a similar pattern with extremely high values also nitrogen in the sediment. So these meadows, if you like, are, are storages of both carbon and nutrients. And if you lose the meadow, you risk all of this being released and being available to the atmosphere, to the marine environment and causing a lot of problems. So they are sort of sitting on, on bombs here, if you like, these meadows. They're quite important that they're there to protect them. So in this project, we set out to see what happens if you lose an ingress meadow. And we compared a total of 12 different meadows. The red on the map here, you can see are Ed meadows that's been lost since the 1980s, they are marked in red, and we compare them to existing meadows. But because the meadows in this marsh strand area is rather poor in conditions because they're slowly being lost, we also used four meadows in this Gulmash field area, which is more pristine, which is more like a control reference uh, region to compare with. And as you might see on the text, we also compared sheltered and exposed meadow in each region because we know from previous studies that exposure is quite important to the amount of, of uh, organic matter that accumulates in the meadow. And here is the results on the top five centimeters of the sediment. We're looking at particular organic, organic carbon. And the first thing you notice is that when you have eelgrass, there's a huge effect of exposure, much more in the sheltered base than the, than the, uh, than the uh, exposed base. Whereas the difference is less in areas where you have lost eelgrass, but overall much lower values when you have lost eelgrass. So there's appear to be a loss of, uh, of carbon when you lose an eelgrass meadow. Same pattern is found also for nitrogen with large losses occurring, but also large effect uh, to happen when you have different exposures. Interesting, we also uh, carried out stable isotope composition analysis of the carbon, and the sediment gives very different signal if you have an eelgrass bed or if you lost the eelgrass. As you can see, there are much more negative values in the areas where you have no eelgrass left. And this is indicating that you have different sources of carbon in this meadow, less of, of eelgrass signal in this, this sediment, indicating most likely that the sediment here has eroded as, as a result of losing the protection of the meadow, which is quite expected. So you have lower carbon, but also loss of sediment after you have lost an eelgrass meadow. This is a summary of the profile down into the sediment down to 35 centimeters depth. And on average, using all these different base, you see that it's about 130% lower amount of carbon and 170% lower amount of nitrogen when you lose an eelgrass meadow. And also the water content, and as I said, the stable isotope differs. So it's indicating that at least down to 35 centimeter, that sediment has been eroded as a result of losing the eelgrass. So taking that assumption that you lost 35 centimeter of the sediment, you can estimate how much carbon and nutrients have you lost from the sediment as a result of losing the eelgrass. And on average, rough number 49 ton of carbon and five tons of nitrogen has been released as a result of losing the eelgrass meadow. So should we care about that? Well, one way to assess that is to look at the economic value of this release or the cost really to society because of this release. And you can assess this for carbon by using something called the social cost of carbon. You can take that value out of the shelf that's available. We use that in the States, for instance, although those values can vary a lot, but this is on a medium number that you can find on, 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 in the literature. 
When it comes to nitrogen, you have to use a different approach. And we use the approach by looking into the cost of removing nitrogen by using measures available in this particular area. It can be like, like planting wetlands or, or developing the sewer system and, and things like that, and taking an average value, which is quite much higher uh, in compared to, to uh, the cost, social cost of carbon. And adding those things together, you can see that this one hectare costs about 4,000 euros when it comes to carbon, but over, over 90,000 euros when it comes to nitrogen. So, so to society, the release of nitrogen is much more valuable or costly, if you like. And that, that I think is an important message when a lot of literature right now focus on carbon, which is good and climate change, but also nitrogen and eutrophication is a big local problem in many areas, in particular on the Swedish West Coast. So here the release of nitrogen is quite important. To try to sum up these big numbers to what it does it mean for this region, since the 1980, we have lost almost a thousand hectares in this area. And using the numbers I just presented to you, we can see how much that runs up to. That's equivalent of releasing almost 50 ton of carbon and 5,000 ton of nitrogen. And so what does that mean in, in numbers compared to other releases? For national emission, it's less than a percentage of uh, carbon dioxide equivalents. Although this 50,000 tons of carbon is one third of the release from, uh, from uh, airplane, uh, public transportation via airplane release. So it's not, in, you cannot just ignore it, it's, it's quite a lot still, but much more so when it comes to nitrogen, this is almost 5% of the annual release from rivers to the oceans in Sweden, which is quite astonishing. So this loss of eelgrass is 5% of the annual re release of nutrients in Sweden. So when you lose an eelgrass bed, you might have a at least temporarily large effect on the environment by this release of nutrients. And if you look at money, the cost of carbon is 5 million euros as, as a one-time cost, and when it comes to nitrogen is over 90 million euros. So altogether, almost 100 million euros because of this loss of eelgrass. So it's, it's quite important to society. All right, this is a pretty bleak and depressing picture that I'm presenting here, but let me try to end and a bit share a note by looking into means to mitigate this. And one way to do that is to use restoration. And we have worked in Sweden over eight years with trying to develop methods to, to restore eelgrass in Scandinavian waters, trying a lot of different techniques, including seeds, etc. But we found that the methods that are most effective, dependable, and, and, and efficient, also cost-effective, is planting using diving, planting shoots by shoot, one by one, is the method that we recommend. It's the fastest one actually to plant, it's the cheapest one because seeds get eaten by crabs and stuff, it doesn't work well in Scandinavian waters. And it's also the least impact on donor matters because you collect the matter, the shoots by hand and harvest them, which is, has no measurable impact on the donor meadows. This is just an example, a small test planting site, 10 by 10 meters. You plant 16 shoots per square meter in June and by already by September, they have increased uh, quite a lot in shoot density, 95 shoots, and the next summer they're already approaching natural density. So they can grow like a weed in good light conditions. But please remember that this works well when you have good conditions like in the Gulmas Fjord. But if you go to those areas where we have the large losses, the, 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 it doesn't work at all. So you can't restore everywhere. We have developed a lot of handbooks, unfortunately in Swedish only, but also tutorials or, or guidelines on video that you can find, you see the link here, and you can look at uh, on the different important steps in eelgrass restoration. So we have working methods for, methods for Scandinavian uh, conditions, but they're quite labor intensive and expensive. And, and because they're slow, you can only plant maybe one to two hectares per year. And remember, it's not possible in all areas because of this type of problems to regime shifts. Right now we're working with new studies to see if we can sand cap bottoms to stabilize the, these problems with the resuspension to try to restore there instead. And we are planning to, to store, restore maybe one to two hectares in the next year. So we are working quite intensively with this type of restoration. And with time, maybe come back with all those ecosystem services that I just mentioned. But let me try to quickly sum up before the time runs out there. Once you lose an eelgrass meadow, natural recovery or even restoration might not be possible. So you have to really protect the old meadows because in the sediment of those meadows, you have large storage 
of carbon and also nitrogen. And when you lose them, you release that amount to the, to the environment. And particularly the nitrogen can be quite costly to society locally. Eelgrass restoration, even if it works in some areas, is often quite difficult and expensive. And for sequestration of carbon, it's rather slow. So summing it up, it's better to protect than to restore eelgrass. That's the take home message for all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Per, uh, for that uh, and your take home message at least had some element of hope uh, for the future. But uh, the, the message is really we need to be taking much more uh, care of our present environment uh, because it will take some time to restore it, even if we can uh, do that. So with uh, uh, there are several questions already coming through, which you should be able to see yourself. We'll take those in a, a short while. But for the moment, I'd like to maybe look at the other types of ecosystem services, particularly fisheries. Uh, and Richard Unsworth is about to tell us about that. So over to you, Richard. Oh, Richard, I can't hear anything myself at the moment. I hope you're online. Okay. Hi there. Can you now hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Thank you for everyone who's taking the time to, to listen to my talk this afternoon. And uh, thank you very much, Pear, for your um, discussion on uh, the value of restoration for, uh, for carbon. And for nitrogen, it's kind of interesting to hear that forgotten story about nitrogen. And it was it, um, it kind of uh, doesn't really hit the radar, but is is critically important. And with with a, an increasing focus on restoring and protecting seagrass meadows for carbon storage, we kind of also forget about another very big story, which is of arguably similar importance for restoring uh, seagrass meadows around the world and that's their value for supporting global fisheries production. We have a, um, a rapidly increasing global human population that is very dependent upon uh, fisheries resources and we have a, a globally declining fisheries stock so in order to continue to, to feed this global population, we need to think about ways of enhancing our fisheries productivity. And there's no better way than to look at the, the base ecosystems that are actually supporting that productivity. And one of those is undoubtedly seagrass meadows. So I'm going to talk today about some of the work that um, I've led and others that I work very closely with that are um, uh, mentioned on this, on this list. And some of that's kind of meta-analysis work, some of it's kind of case study um, research, and a lot of it's underpinned by the efforts of thousands of scientists all, all around the world who've published uh, research in this area. So seagrasses themselves are not incredibly biodiverse, uh, 60 to 70 species, depending on who you, who you speak to around the world. But it's the, the ecosystem that they create that harbors a huge amount of biodiversity. So whether you're looking at the, the small crustaceans, the, the bivalves, the gastropod mollusks, or the, the fish communities, all those different groups of uh, animals have a huge diversity of life um, when you, um, in, in seagrass ecosystems around the world. So it's fair to say that these are hotspots of biodiversity. And uh, if you look along the, the coasts of Wales, where I'm based, or Indonesia, and you come across a seagrass meadow, you will find um, a lot of biodiversity. And uh, 
in the Indo-Pacific region, we may find up to seven, 700 species of fish utilizing seagrass. Uh, uh, in the, the less diverse Atlantic, that might be uh, around about 70. And, uh, but, th but those trends um, exist all around the world. But what is it within a seagrass meadow that actually uh, provides the support for that biodiversity? And I guess as uh, Pear was kind of discussing, seagrasses are um, highly productive. So they typically live in, in sandy, muddy environments. And those sandy, muddy environments are, are largely two-dimensional and uh, have a low diversity of animal life. If you put a, uh, a seagrass meadow in it, suddenly you've got a, a huge primary productivity happening. And when you compare that primary productivity against various grasslands, against various types of, of forest ecosystems, then uh, seagrasses really do uh, punch above their, of their weight. They're hugely productive, um, possibly more productive in some cases than uh, types of, uh, of rainforests. And with that productivity, they, they influence both the physical and the biochemical elements of the environment. Because they're so productive, they're producing a huge amount of oxygen on, on a daily basis, and that oxygen has to come, go somewhere. Some of it um, diffuses out of, their, out of their leaves, and some of it will actually be released through their, through their roots in the, uh, in the muddy uh, sediments. And typically those muddy sediments on a, under a seagrass meadow will be um, anoxic. They'll be highly sulfurous, so if you disturb them with your your, your finger, you'll kind of get that sort of um, rotten egg smell coming out of them. And by seagrass is releasing that oxygen into that, um, into that sediment, you're converting that sulfide into sulfate, and uh, you're oxygenating that, those sediments. And that, that has a kind of a feedback in terms of um, supporting bacterial activity and a huge sort of biodiverse macroinvertebrate faunal community. And uh, that animal life in itself then creates um, a food web of, of resources for other organisms to uh, um, exploit. And you've, when you've kind of gone from this sort of muddy two-dimensional environment to this three-dimensional structure, you've created an enormous amount of uh, surface area. And if you've got any sort of plankton in the water or if you've got uh, an excess of nutrients, the whole series of uh, beasties who are ready to jump onto that uh, new surface area and uh, make the most of it. So typically when you get a uh, bit of excess nutrients, you get epiphytes, small microalgae growing on that surface area. And as Pear kind of pointed out, when that kind of those nutrients get to a, a level of excess, then that can actually suffocate the, uh, the seagrass. But at a low to medium density, those epiphytes are, are really important in um, actually stimulating a huge kind of food web um, that consumes that, that algae. And that three-dimensional structure is also a, a, a great place for, for animals to hide. So if you're a, a small beastie running away from uh, bigger predators, then a seagrass meadow is a really excellent place to, to hide and to increase your, your chances of survival. And that three-dimensional structure, as uh, Per was actually pointing out, um, has a, a feedback kind of mechanism in terms of how it's, it's trapping particles out of the water column. And that's because the water slows as it hits the, um, the seagrass, there's some sort of level of friction that happens, and that causes the, uh, the water slows, particles drop out, and end up on the on the sediment, and uh, the water becomes less turbulent and it becomes uh, clearer, and that's creating an environment that's more affable for a range of, of animals to live in. So really, animals want to live in a seagrass meadow. It's an excellent environment for a for a young uh, fish, for a, a range of different uh, invertebrates. <clears throat> 
So therefore, it's not really a surprise that uh, this biodiversity and all these kind of great uh, habitat structures um, support um, a range of fisheries around the world. So that, that kind of function can be split into uh, three kind of uh, processes. First being um, the role of seagrasses in providing nursery habitat for, for juvenile fish. The second being that the, the primary productivity that uh, exists within that seagrass um, is often exported into other areas and that can actually stimulate and subsidize the, uh, um, the, the biodiversity and the, the fishery productivity in other adjacent environments. And because you've got this um, biodiverse fauna present in the seagrass, then um, doesn't it take long for a fisherman to work out that um, that's a great place to go and catch fish, go and collect invertebrates, and uh, that uh, function exists all around the, uh, the world. Here's a, um, a figure um, created by John Lefchek over in the, the US, and he examined all the available literature looking at the, the density, growth, and survival of juvenile fish living in a, a range of different habitats uh, around the world. And for a, um, a nursery habitat to exist, it needs to actually um, enhance the survival, enhance the growth, um, and have a high density of um, animal life relative to uh, other habitat types. And uh, what we can clearly see is that um, in this figure, they're using uh, the term SAV, a submerged aquatic vegetation. It's a very uh, US centric term. Um, and basically that's because it includes seagrass, but it also includes some uh, um, uh, freshwater macrophytes as well. And what you can see here is that seagrasses are punching um, above their weight against relative to uh, mangroves, coral reefs, marshes, um, and various types of algae in, in in supporting the, the growth, survival, and density of um, a range of different uh, fish species. And I, I guess that the important thing here as well is that the, uh, the standard deviation of, of those measures is much reduced. That's possibly because there's been a lot of work done on uh, fish communities in uh, seagrasses, um, but it also is a lot less than uh, the, the variation you can see in um, other, other habitat types. As a result of these kind of, um, this high density, high growth uh, and high survival of a juvenile fish in seagrass, it's not surprising that they then end up supporting a lot of the world's uh, biggest fisheries. So there's, there's reasonable evidence that um, Alaskan Pollock, Atlantic Cod, um, Pacific herring, they, they uh, obtain benefits by utilizing seagrasses as, uh, as nursery um, habitat. So if you're a, a young a larval fish settling into a, a coastal environment for the first time, then you're looking for a, a nursery habitat. And if, if you're unlucky and you can't find a, a seagrass meadow, you might end up on a, a muddy, sandy uh, bottom type. And in that environment, there's not food. So you're spending a lot of energy chasing that uh, food. You're possibly quite exposed to predators. You're running away from predators all the time. And uh, you're spending a lot of energy. If you're lucky enough to have landed into a seagrass meadow, then there's plenty of places to hide from those predators. So you're not, you're not spending energy running away. And there's lots of crustaceans to eat, lots of small invertebrates present that you can consume um, without um, spending a lot of energy hunting. So your, your chances of putting on weight uh, are much improved if, if you're in that seagrass meadow. So at the end of the, the first year of development, your chances of being uh, heavier than the, the sad fish um, are much higher. And we, we know in a lot of studies that the weight of a uh, of something like a cod at the end of its first year is quite indicative of its its life uh, survival chances. 
So it's chances of, therefore, of um, reproducing and contributing to that, uh, that spawning stock are, uh, are greatly increased by its uh, uh, early years being spent in a, in a seagrass meadow. So if we expand that kind of thought about um, our nursery habitats to um, a, a regional uh, scale, and then the best example of this is to, to look at the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, where there's been a lot of studies looking at different types of um, nursery habitats, uh, whether that be algal, whether it be um, sea grass, um, or whether it be other kind of reef type um, habitats. And a study by uh, Emma Jackson published in Conservation Biology a few years ago um, estimated that um, seagrass associated species contributed 30 to 40 percent of the, the commercial fisheries landings and 29% uh, to recreational um, fisheries. And those contributions actually had a, uh, a very significant uh, input to the, uh, the economy of that, of that region um, in the order of uh, 50 to 90 million for um, the commercial fisheries and uh, over 112 uh, million for, for commercial um, fisheries. So, uh, if we uh, allow seagrasses to degrade and uh, we, we don't restore them, then uh, we're losing that economic contribution to uh, um, our economy. And when we look at uh, those examples from, uh, from Sweden, uh, the similar stark um, figures from uh, the UK that show that seagrasses have, have been lost over very large scales, then um, there's a realization there that we've, we've not just lost um, carbon storage values, we've not just lost uh, nitrogen cycling values, but we've also lost a huge economic value to our, our fisheries landings. So seagrasses also help subsidize the, uh, the productivity of fisheries in uh, adjacent uh, habitats and environments. So sometimes that's a, um, a, a fish grazing in a, a, a seagrass meadow and then moving into a, a, a deeper water environment and excreting all that out, um, passing the carbon on, passing the nitrogen on, uh, stimulating productivity um, in adjacent locations. Sometimes it's detritus that's breaking down um, as the, the sort of autumn um, occurs and uh, the winter storms come in, and that can then be washed um, into deeper environments, sinking, uh, stimulating the productivity of otherwise kind of quite um, uh, a nutrient poor environments. And uh, there's some great sort of examples of uh, this, even at a sort of quirky level, where um, some there's deep sea uh, ecosystems off of the, uh, the banks of the uh, of uh, the Bahamas um, in, in the Atlantic ridges, where there's entire ecosystems that are dependent upon that detritus um, making its way um, into, the, into the deep. So this, this trophic subsidy can uh, often be quite, um, quite large and there's a, a variety of different mechanisms that lead to it kind of spreading throughout the, uh, the coastal seascape and possibly onto the continental shelf and into the, uh, into the deep sea. So if you've got all these seagrass meadows that are full of, full of life, whether that be uh, gastropod mollusks, whether it be sea cucumbers, whether it be abundant fish, then uh, um, it's not surprising that there's a lot of uh, fishes out there who are targeting um, that uh, productivity. And as a, as a group um, of uh, researchers, we, we, we began to look at the uh, academic literature on this topic and uh, quickly found that uh, there wasn't the, the data present that, that we um, actually expected to explain this. So by uh, getting a whole series of academic um, conservation managers, um, um, ecologists, um, a variety of experts from around the world to uh, answer our questions. 
we found a lot of evidence that, that, that shows that seagrasses really are targeted as a fishery habitat all around the, uh, the world. There's no better area to kind of look at the, this role than uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, it's a particular case study site where um, myself and uh, uh, my wife Leanne have, have done a lot of work over the years. And that's the, the Wakatobi uh, National Park in Indonesia. And in many parts of uh, Southeast Asia particularly, um, we find communities living very, very closely associated to, uh, to seagrass. And that means that of an average low tide, those communities often go out for recreation or for um, subsistence to collect their daily food. And uh, uh, that, that, that activity is as much a, a, a social and cultural activity as it is a, a, an activity for, for supplying food. And because these, these ecosystems are they're near shore, they're shallow water, um, they're soft sediment. It's very easy to, uh, to go fishing with, with limited gear. Uh, this, this canoeist is a nice example there, uh, taking a, a gill net out into, into a shallow water environment. Uh, doesn't even need an engine and uh, will potentially get a, a very big catch. So throughout the, uh, the tropics, there's a lot of evidence that um, seagrasses are being um, exploited on a, on a daily basis um, for their abundant fauna. Sadly, like the, the kind of larger conservation uh, management story for seagrasses, and the fisheries associated to these habitats are often unregulated, they're unmanaged, and in many cases they're probably un unsustainable. And that presents a, a significant global problem when you, you think at the the large extensive area that seagrasses cover around the world and the uh, amount of people that are actually um, exploiting the, the fauna uh, that comes from these uh, localities. And um, myself and a whole number of colleagues have published some uh, research recently that's really showed how big a, a problem this uh, unsustainability of seagrass fisheries activity um, is. Um, only last week we published a paper that showed how the, the vast kind of um, investment in mosquito nets for, uh, for malaria pro, um, control is actually ending up as uh, fishing nets, um, exploiting juvenile fish along the, uh, the coast of uh, East Africa. And uh, the, the complexities of, of supply chains mean that uh, in places such as Sri Lanka, where poverty, uh, malnutrition are uh, problematic. Um, we find that fisheries for shrimp are resulting in uh, large amounts of um, um, bycatch. And a rather disturbing part of this story is the uh, increasing extent of what we term to be fish fences that exist throughout the tropics to exploit the, uh, the fauna present in uh, sea grasses. These are sort of semi permanent structures, as you can see from this, this image, the, the, the backdrop. Uh, and uh, these can be 100 to sometimes three, 400 uh, meters in, in length. And uh, they just basically exploit every last uh, moving organism and uh, trap them into a, um, a, a big, um, big funnel. Uh, and they have very large bycatch problems and their, their catch per unit effort rapidly declines over, over time leading to more intensive use of this, this sort of gear type. And we found this um, in areas throughout the, uh, the tropics. Um, very easy to set it up with cheap net and a lot of poles ripped out of a mangrove forest. When we think about the management of fisheries around the world, when they're, they're done at a sort of stock level, models are developed to um, determine the sort of maximum sustainable yield of, of that fishery. Well, unfortunately, there's a very big disconnect that exists between that, that um, uh, population modeling and the, the ecosystems that are underpinning that productivity and supporting them. And uh, we know that 
when you degrade CRSs, you, you lose nursery value. And uh, largely models don't actually um, include that sort of thinking. So when we um, model a, a fishery to be um, underfished or overfished, um, the decision is largely based on some sort of black box assumption that there is a nursery habitat uh, present. And uh, models need to sort of change to think about uh, that value and to kind of um, change to be uh, including um, the value of, of CRES. And when we look around the, the world to, to think about the evidence of seagrass change over time and, and degradation, there's a lot of evidence that shows that when we actually lose a, a seagrass meadow, that has significant consequences in terms of uh, fisheries catch per unit effort. And there's great examples from Indonesia, from Australia, um, from Sweden, and uh, across the, uh, the US. I guess, if, if you want to um, secure a, uh, the value and the sustainability of a fishery over the long term, you need to think about the, the conservation um, of seagrass habitats. And in many parts of the world, we have lost seagrasses and we continue to lose seagrasses. So restoration has to be part of the, the story of trying to um, recover the, the productivity of a lot of fisheries. And there is the sort of the hope that if you if you build it, the fish will come. And largely, I think the evidence is out there that um, as we uh, we restore sea grasses, then we uh, we see an improved um, abundance of, of animal life presence present, and uh, that impacts um, um, fisheries productivity. Unfortunately, the actual surprisingly, the literature is not full of lots of these examples, but where, where it does exist, um, it is clear that over time, the, the animal life does recover um, into restore seagrass meadows. So in conclusion, seagrasses alter the local environment, enhancing its biodiversity, and this leads to significant support for fisheries productivity. And this can be evidenced at local, regional, and global scales. Unfortunately, uh, this kind of this role of seagrass in supporting fisheries is not really uh, integrated into um, management modeling, whether that be at a, uh, a European level, a, a tropical uh, level, whatever it be, um, seagrasses are not really part of that conservation management because often uh, biodiversity uh, sits over here, uh, fisheries over here, and there's no uh, disconnect between the two. Loss of seagrass equals the loss of fisheries productivity. And there's a lot of potential for seagrasses to be restored and that can lead to um, fish recovery. And uh, finally, I guess seagrasses, they are um, just plants and uh, we were good as uh, a human race at growing plants. And I think we can re restore seagrasses, not just for their, their value as a uh, for mitigating climate change, but also for supporting uh, um, um, fisheries productivity. Thank you. Okay, Richard, thank you very much. Uh, if, uh, Pear, you could put your video back on. Uh, that's very good. Uh, thank you to our two speakers for really two excellent talks. Uh, you've made me a very happy fish. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, we now have some questions uh, for you. I have to go to my second screen here. Uh, and, and a couple of people did marvelous things. They actually sent their questions in before you started speaking. Uh, so we'll come to those maybe uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, but I'm just looking here now at some of the other uh, talks first or other questions first. And, and one question was, uh, Pei, you mentioned that the carbon stocks in the Swedish settings uh, were particularly high and uh, the question is really why is this? Is it to do with the size of the grass beds, uh, eel grass beds, or are there other reasons why it's particularly high? Thanks. Th that is a good question and we are not really sure why that is, although the pattern is quite clear. There is a lot of uh, 
archipelago and fjords that make these meadows quite protected. And that by itself means that they can accumulate higher levels of, of, of uh, organic material just because they are not so exposed. But that is not the whole explanation. And another possible explanation is that it's a lot of, of fine um, silt and clay, glacial clay in this area. And, and because of that, they can contain higher amounts of, of, of organic mat material and carbon. So I think it may be a combination of those two, but it, it's not well studied. Okay, and and I suppose then a follow-on question here is um, to do with the once you've lost this carbon and nitrogen, uh, does that also have an effect on whether the ecosystem can really recover or not? Is there a sort of feedback mechanism uh, to uh, you know you've got to build up the carbon and nitrogen in order to have a healthy environment? for more seagrass to grow. Is there a, any uh, chance of that? That's an interesting question. I, I don't think that is an important factor preventing seagrass or eelgrass to recover. Uh, most seagrass species are quite, uh, they can accept quite low nutrient levels. They're good at storing nutrients in the rhizomes, et cetera, over the winter. So, and, and the levels after you lose the seagrass bed, if you remember those values are still quite high. So I don't think a lack of nutrients or if you like carbon, I mean, carbon doesn't play a big role because of course seagrasses pick the carbon from the water in, in the carbon dioxide, but uh, the nutrients, no, I don't think they're nutrient limited today, even after they've been lost. I think most studies show that it's, it's light requirements that are mostly limiting them either because of turbidity because of overgrowth of algae on top of them, as, as Richard was also pointing out in a nice way. Okay, uh, that's useful. And our question really sort of for both of you, you, you both mentioned about uh, factors that uh, affect the, the restoration or the regrowth of, of eelgrass, uh, such as turbidity. Um, and the question is that very often before restoration can happen, you have to get the environment right for that. And, and obviously water quality is one of those. Are there any methods that are actually being looked at at how you can reduce, uh, say, uh, the turbidity of the water in, in some way, or and also uh, the effects of smothering algae? What, what, are there other operations and other experiments going on to address these environmental effects? You want to go, Richard? You want to go first? Yeah, go on, then... go on. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that partially. I suppose you'll, you'll be able to uh, add uh, to this. There's a lot of work that's been done in uh, coming out of the, the Netherlands, particularly looking at uh, stabilizing sediments um, uh, using kind of a range of sort of physical structures. Um, one um, recent range of studies has looked at using sort of um, biodegradable plastics to um, to stabilize sediments. There's been a range of uh, studies that um, have uh, used kind of different types of matting um, to actually uh, reduce that kind of um, uh, redistribution of sediments. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not aware that at a, at a scale uh, of a sort of whole embayment kind of uh, where you might uh, conduct a, a large-scale restoration project, anyone's achieved uh, the, uh, um, the 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 stopping of the uh, resuspensioning happening. But there's certainly a lot of work trying to to look at those at those feedbacks going on. Um, I, I I know I don't know whether Pear you 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 were involved or who 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 did this, but I've I've seen pictures uh, probably on Twitter I think at some point of people. Um, using shell um, uh, material to actually to l essentially line um, um, areas of uh, soft sediment to stop the the sort of resuspension re of uh, a fine material. Um, I don't know whether Pear, you've got any more um, input than than I've just given. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, that that's great. Lots of work done in the Netherlands. They're very good at by on in physical engineering in, in that country. The uh, I've not been involved in, in putting out shells. We are working with, and also colleagues in, in Denmark, in the Odense Fjord has worked on something called sand capping, which is similar, but in less strong 
energy environment like we have in Scandinavia, where it's, it's mainly wave energy that we are troubled with, not tides, it's just to put a thin layer of sand on the bottom and see if that could sort of make the tip the system back by improving light condition. Then you can plant on top of the sand, but it's still on an experimental scale. The, uh, the other question was about smothering algae, and it, I think it's important to separate two types of algae here. You have the most common problem is fast-growing, filamentic, epiphytic, or, or free-drifting algae that, that can bloom up in, in, in calm condition and lots of nutrients. Those are hard to lock out, in a sense, because they usually establish themselves by spores. So you have to really address the, the nutrient supply, I think, to address them. And as someone mentioned here on... on on, on the notes on Twitter and the questions that there was a lot of overgrowth on the pictures I show. Yes, we, we still have a big problem with this type of fouling algae on top of the eelgrass. But it didn't seem to kill our plantings, though, although they look pretty miserable, I, I agree. But when it comes to the other type of algae, it, it's, it's the one that drifts on the bottom, and that's perennial algae, like fucus, like the you know, bladder wax or, or the other types that doesn't float, that can lie on the bottom and survive there. Those we have been trying to maybe put up fences. We've done that in, on smaller scale, but it's, it's very difficult to put things out in the ocean. They get overgrown and, and catch a lot of wave energy. You could possibly harvest them. It hasn't been tried on a large scale as far as I know, but they are really a growing problem, at least on, on the Swedish West Coast and also in our colleagues in Denmark, that they take over the system when they lose the eelgrass. And, and it's a quite a different system. It's not stable. It's a different not as good of a fish habitat, for instance, et cetera. But I think more studies are needed there. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Yes, I'm reminded also of some work that's going on within the Mercies project where they're uh, trying to see whether the introduction of, uh, of mussels and oysters and oyster beds at the same time as trying to transplant uh, seagrass can aid the uh, establishment of the uh, seagrass beds mm. and certainly in terms of other restoration projects where they're trying to in reintroduce oysters to coastal areas they're putting down the, the, the old shells that I think it's called the culch uh, are in those areas uh, over the, the seabed in, in order to stimulate uh, greater uh, growth of oysters and mussels uh, which then may uh, I suppose uh, help in some areas where there's also seagrass, uh, the reintroduction of that. And the second question we had here was actually to do with uh, uh, um, levels or government levels to address eco or conservation moorings. This is something I've not heard about um, to prevent scouring of seagrass beds. Do either of you know about those methods? Um, I, I guess the, that it is a problem in um, um, particular parts of uh, the world where um, chain moorings uh, within seagrass meadows turn around and will actually scar the seagrass over time and basically prevent any level of, of, of recovery happening. And um, parts of southern England particularly, uh, there's uh, a, a lot of problems with, with that sort of um, scarring activity and but all around the world there's been various kind of innovations whether they be simple uh, and cheap sort of little innovations to to float a, uh, a chain off the bottom and reduce that impact or whether they be at the scale of trying to um, build a complete system that's completely ecologically sustainable um, these modifications can happen to prevent those impacts on uh, of moorings on on seagrasses. In terms of government funding for that, um, I, I'm not aware of government funding happening, but I know in, on the, uh, the south coast of uh, England, there is a, a big EU life project just about to start. Um, and um, hopefully that, that will uh, maintain its funding in the current climate. And um, a part of that is about trying to um, um, invest in some of these eco moorings to provide kind of demonstrations and to to spread their, their use uh, across uh, seagrass meadows to ultimately reduce that um, um, impact. Okay, thank you. I was noticing we've had uh, three other contributions uh, while we've been having this uh, session. Uh, one saying that in uh, the new in the Netherlands in the intertidal, uh, 
the introduction of uh, shells has, I think, worked well. Uh, and yes, we did use shells to stabilize and it worked well. Um, and this I suppose, is one, one of the questions that I've always wondered about is, in terms of getting uh, seagrass to come back, is there also a, an, an issue of, of scale? Are we just doing this in a too small a scale uh, or, or are there projects now looking at the, a bigger scale which might be more successful? Um, I wonder if either of you could comment on that. Uh, okay, do you want to talk first? And I'll add. Sure. Go ahead, Richard. Okay, I'll go on then. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I guess that um, there's a, um, a review that was written by um, um, a Dutch researcher uh, and a whole team of international experts on, on restoration. And they looked at all the sort of historic cha changes that resulted from uh, restoration projects all around the world. And they, they've clearly demonstrated that unless you actually restore seagrasses at any uh, meaningful scale, then the survivability of that, uh, that seagrass is, uh, is reduced. It's the kind, of the, the kind of safety in numbers concept, really, that um, if you only plant, uh, plant two, two or three meters of seagrass, it's, uh, it's resilience to um, physical uh, and biological kind of feedbacks is, is, uh, is pretty, pretty low. And as that kind of scales up, the, the size of the, the sort of feedback that happens, its, its ability to trap um, particles, its ability to hold the sediment together rapidly um, increases. So yes, yeah, scale is absolutely uh, an important issue and people are working towards kind of scaling up. Uh, and in, in the Chesapeake Bay uh, in the US where uh, they're the, the sort of heroes of, of seagrass restoration, they've, they've managed to do it at, at thousands of hectares of scale. Um, they have managed to uh, scale up, but I guess some of the environmental conditions have, uh, have helped their, their cause uh, in terms of lower kind of tidal movements, in terms of um, reduced predation upon on seeds, uh, different factors that, that um, we're fighting with in Europe that make it a bit more um, difficult. Yes. I agree completely with your statement there, Richard. And, and I just want to acknowledge that Marike, who, who wrote that review, is is attending. I see her name on the on the comment list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice to have you listening, Marike. So uh, yes, it, indeed, and, and that is what really what we are fighting for with this local regime shift in Sweden. If we're going to restore there, we need to restore on a scale that passes that tipping point, that threshold, that turns that negative spiral into a positive one. And, and of course, the big question here is, what is that scale? It's most likely unique for each embayment, but there is somewhere there when you plant large enough to actually make the water quality improve over time instead of just falling back to, to the turbid state. So it's, it's a really big and important question for restoration. I don't think everywhere, I, I think this example with the Bob Off work there in the Virginia base, there it seemed to have it was just waiting for seeds, basically, that area. It didn't have any regime shift problems. But if, if you have that, then I think when you have regime shift problems, then scale is everything. So I, I think it's a very uh, warm question for, for restoration. OK, thank you for, for the, that. And one final question, therefore, it almost comes down to cost now. Um, if we're going to restore, uh, um, the, the question here actually sort of pits, the, you know, which is it better to do, um, seagrass, meadows, or mangrove forests uh, to get the best results? But I suspect that the question, the answer is going to be both. Um, but it does uh, ask, the, I suppose the question really is, are there any studies that you know of? We've, we've looked at separate ecosystem services here. Do you know of any other studies that have actually looked at ecosystems in the great, greater part of the whole and has done a costing that one could say, oh, it's better to put money into seagrass meadows than mangroves or other way around. Do you know of any studies at all? Well, I, do, I don't think there are studies that, that uh, show that, but there's a lot of literature, um, particularly from the tropics uh, and less, to a less degree from the um, temperate environment, where people have uh, kind of investigated the, the sort of um, 
everything from the, the sort of biodiversity uh, to the, the biogeochemical kind of connectivity that exists between different coastal habitat types. So, um, and there's a, a great title to a, a, a paper, I can't, some, can't remember where it's, it's uh, done, but um, uh, the power of the three, uh, it, uh, and it's a, a tropical study, but it's the power of having a, a seagrass meadow, a mangrove forest and a coral reef all linked together and how that all operates as one, one wider connected ecosystem rather than pitting one habitat against the, uh, uh, the rest. And um, I, I'd be amazed, but we don't, uh, uh, wasn't the case that um, you get similar interactions between salt marshes, uh, seagrasses, uh, kelp forests, kind of mussel or oyster reefs. But those, those interactions are not as well understood in a, in a temperate um, environment. So I don't, I don't think there is a, an argument for restoration of one over the other. Uh, they're all complex, they're all expensive, and uh, um, we, we need to, uh, to keep working towards the, the restoration of all of them. Okay, thank you. And Mo uh, Per, do you uh, have any uh, uh, final comments? Yeah, I think that, I mean, it's important to see restoration as not the quick fix the solution for all this problem of, of, of losing uh, uh, seagrass and other habitats. It, it's something that it, it could be very important as a complement, but most of all, we have to stop the ongoing destruction because it's going, the destruction is so much faster than we can possibly hope to restore in some sense, because particularly mm. seagrass is, it doesn't have a very good track record in success. So I think don't forget about protecting what we have first and then to ch improve the large scale environmental conditions for natural recovery. And in that recovering process, restoration can be a very good means to jumpstart when it might be a recruitment limitation to, to prevent natural recovery. So I think that's a little bit how restoration should be seen because scale wise can be daunting. I don't think we can hope in Europe to accomplish what happened in the Virginia base where the condition was just perfect. It has been showing to Marie and others work that it's quite difficult to restore actually. So mm. we have to see that for what it is. And it's not a solution for our mistakes. Okay, and, and in that you've answered the last question we had, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so Richard, have you got any final comments at all or uh, is that it? Uh, yeah, that's it. I think, uh, yeah, um, um, interesting giving the talk and uh, nice to hear Pear as well, actually. It was uh, uh, fun. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for our two speakers. Uh, it has been a really uh, great experience and, and useful to have, and I'm glad I've been in this place uh, at, the mo at this time. Okay, so uh, thank you to all of you that have attended the, uh, the, the webinar. Um, we like to feature uh, all sorts of projects on the Mercy's website and also in our newsletters. And we're actually in the process of putting together the final newsletter uh, for the project, which we will present to a meeting with the European Commission uh, in uh, next year at some point, uh, probably about sort of April time. And uh, this will, I hope, have effects on uh, the future attitudes to uh, marine ecosystem restoration and the need really for future work in understanding how we can improve the environment so that restoration projects perhaps uh, have been or will be more successful than uh, some of them have been in the past. So if you'd like to be, uh, contribute to these, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and also, if you want to know about future or our last webinar, uh, please get in touch with us as well, and we'll make sure that you know uh, all about it. Um, so if also you'd like to give us some feedback as to what you thought was good or bad about this uh, webinar, that's always useful to have. And finally, thank you for the speakers and for you for attending, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>